You remember Bam Majera? The CHAOS KING OF THE OOs, THE ODDIES, THE WEAPON OF MASS DESTRUCTION! Alright, listen. I spent every single one of my teen years in the 2000s, okay? Year after year, throughout that entire decade, just kept making project after project. And you know, I've always had this idea that he was like one of those monsters from- Oh yeah, from Sleepwalkers, where they just like suck the life out of people to stay young. Because I need something to explain how this guy seems to have the life spark of like 20 different people. And each series he made was basically an episode of him destroying something. He started with shows where he would destroy his own body, then moved on to destroy Destroying the lives of his family, then his marriage, and eventually his career. Are you crying? Yeah! <laughs> now, I'm sure you might recognize the heartogram tattoo. I mean, oh my gosh, how embarrassing to have to have that for the rest of your life. Imagine being 20 20 and having to walk around, and you'd probably just now have soccer moms who are trying to pray for you because they think you're Wiccan or something. <laughs> So I would believe that skateboarding wasn't the only thing that got Bam Majera noticed by Jeff Tremaine as he was gathering his Jackass whack pack. Before Jackass, Bam Majera wasn't just skateboarding, he was also making these absolutely like gonzo videos in rainy Westchester, Pennsylvania with his friends, which eventually kind of evolved into what might be known now as the CKY video series. And it was after he got a little shine from his Jackass fame that he actually made a direct-to-video full-length movie called Haggard. And I remember very clearly as a 12-year-old boy going into Zoomies, and they had these stacks with DVDs on them. And I would see this movie here sitting next to bum fights, and I would gaze at these videos and just marvel at the oppressive energy that they radiated. I, I just wondered to myself, what could be so extreme in them that not only were they rated R, they also had a parental advisory sticker on it. I, I, I gotta call a fucking cop. This is fucking crazy. I can't fucking live. It's like a whole group of baby boys that were abandoned at Skatetopia and never learned that there was an outside world where injuring yourself and your friends and showing your butthole is a little less typical. And I want to say this is probably one of the reasons why I think this movie is pretty important because how often do you get such an untamed group of people with not only the funds but the organization to take all the steps fully needed to release a movie? I mean this is a movie that you cannot get anywhere else and this is a movie that doesn't borrow from anything and absolutely nothing borrows from this movie. It's, it's it's a cinematic mutation, so it's definitely original, but depending on who you are, you might see its originality in much the same way that you might see the stunts in this movie. It's like They aren't necessarily difficult or impressive, they're just things that the average person just wouldn't never want to do. Okay. Now, like I mentioned, this was supposed to be a sequel to Haggard, which came out in 2003. Finally, it wasn't until 2009, because of setbacks and whatnot, that this movie came out under the title Mean Hags. Which I think kind of explains its obscurity, because in 2009, the dominoes leading up to Bamajera's appearance on Dr. Phil had already kind of started falling. I mean, this is one of the most unhinged and repulsive movies I have ever watched. And it takes seconds of watch time before you already feel like this movie is taking you victim. Yes, behold, the garbage juicer. Huh? What? Oh. <laughs> what? 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 Oh my gosh! It's complete chaos at its very structure. Okay, what most filmmakers do is they come up with a basic idea and then they kind of work to find a series of events that support that idea. From what I can tell, not this movie. This movie almost watches like the crew just kind of showed up to random locations, got shit-faced, and just did whatever their demented drunk minds thought was funny that day. So yes, there's this basic story of this invention called the garbage juicer that turns your garbage into root beer. That's the best damn root beer ever had! And it gets stolen from Bam Margera's crew and they need to go get it back. But the things that this movie does to include just these moments like Ryan Dunn shoving a giant syringe in his butt defies all storytelling sensibility. You know, and that's assuming that this idea of drinking garbage didn't already break the typical storytelling norms. The reality is, is trying to unwrap this movie's plot would be a lot like opening one of those prank jars that explode when you open it. <laughs> 
Probably a better place to start would be talking about the sprawling cast of this movie. Now, something that's probably most notable is that almost every single person that appears on camera, no matter how insignificant, was somebody that Bam personally knew. He invited his skateboard friends, his cigar shop friends, all sorts of random people that have just this unique history that led them into this mess. I mean, of course, there are the usual suspects. There's Ryan Dunn, who plays Bam's hopelessly cupped friend, who spends the whole movie trying to gain the respect of his girlfriend, Libby, who has a... Um, a questionable relationship with her ex. And Brandon DiCamillo, who not only plays two main characters, but count them like five other sub characters in this movie. And he manages to find a uniquely grating voice for every single one of them. <laughs> Should we go over there? Yeah, we better. <laughs> One, there's Pons, the long-haired original inventor of the garbage juicer, as well as the villain Rut Roo, I don't know where they're coming up with these names, who steals it and he's trying to take the profits. And I want to point out, while it may not be that obvious from like the MTV stuff you see, uh, Deco has a very prominent role in the creativity between a lot of the CKY adjacent material from the very beginning. And here you can see he's actually one of the three director and writer credits of this movie. He seems kind of like the class clown of the group who lives his life like an improv show, which is probably why he ended up playing so many characters. And I would venture to guess, for better or worse, he's probably responsible for a lot of this movie's comedy. In that same director and writer credits, you're going to see Joe Franz, who also has a character to play in this movie as well. And he's another one that has uh, seemingly been a part of the group from early, early on, and apparently has done a lot of the behind-the-scenes production stuff, and has gone on to have a pretty legitimate career in media, and I have to imagine that the few stylish-looking scenes probably came from him. And then there's the other usual suspects like Reich Jan and Brandon Novak, whose character is only ever referred to in this movie as the gay biker, who was a character I genuinely grew to fear when he appeared on screen because I truly didn't know what revolting thing he would do next. Then we have this amazing entourage of Bam's family members who really just all have this knack to perform. Of course, Don Vito, the unit himself, who was arguably the star of Beaver La Bam, whose eloquence rivals Oliver Reed, who mostly just sits and yells at people from his porch dressed like a judge. And of course, there's Phil and April, who of course will always just make me laugh almost no matter what they're doing because, I mean, I think the ongoing joke is how normal they seem. And uh, seeing someone so normal in anything Bam's doing, just it seems so out of place that they suddenly become the, the shocking piece of the whole picture. Is it real? Is it real? Yeah. <laughs> and in this movie, they play Ryan Dunn's evil girlfriend's parents. They, they have this dinner scene where Ryan comes over for dinner and they spend the whole scene coming up with creative ways to show disrespect to him. Uh, while Phil is just absolutely fawning over Bruno, Libby's ex-boyfriend. From the beginning, you're like, okay, I get it. But for some reason in this scene, um, they drive it home so hard that I sort of found myself in this delirium where seeing Ryan meekly sitting around people who are ruthlessly crushing his spirit actually kind of became funny to me. Oh, that's not going to be enough for you. Maybe you want some of Tucker's. That'd be great. Hey, Tucker, hand that over. And then there's a premiere performance from Phil Sr., Phil's Phil, who plays a hardened war vet who's trying to berate his son into getting a job. By the end of the day, you better have a job or else. You see this? It's gonna hurt. And, and he first appears on screen, pulling up with a bloody bandage around his head and a gun pulled for absolutely no reason. Get in the car, dingbag. It turns out this, this really ends up being one of my favorite characters. And it's honestly, it's just hard to say why. I think it has just has something to do with him obviously being a non-actor that just dryly delivers out these ridiculous lines as though he doesn't even know what he's saying. Shut up, you sissy. Shut up, you sissy. You'd screw up a wet dream. You screw up a wet dream. To me, it's just infinitely more funny than any of the line delivery of any of the younger talent that are at the front of this movie. And similarly, there's Ruthie Majera, Bam's aunt. Suck my ass! She plays Bam's mom in this movie who also is a very obvious non-actor, and she just bowls over everyone else on the screen with her. Hey, yeah, you get me all wet. I'm not talking about my foot. Now, and you have to admit that there's something special about an aunt who's willing to make out with Brandon Novak to help her nephew's vision become a reality. And then there's the cameos where we have Mark the Bagger, a fascinating man, who everyone agrees will make you wonder for at least a few minutes if the way he talks is his, truly his real voice. And I'd like, I want saved by the bell. 
Oh, there's other guys. Full House. Full House, yeah. Partially known for his appearances on Howard Stern, where we learn about his kind of questionable friendship with Jimmy Pop of the Bloodhound Gang, um, who, of course, I mean, he's in this movie, too. Agent! Mark, he plays Phil Sr.'s son, Ralph, who gets kicked out of school and is now trying to escape his father's wrath. And while it helps to know how much of a confident character he is in real life, I just absolutely loved watching him. When he shows up on screen, there's a very clear, noticeable shift in how happy I was feeling while I was watching this. Here we come! Holy shit! Daddy, no! Part of this might be because many of his scenes are, of course, with Phil Sr. And seeing that both of their uncanny qualities blend is its a real treat. Does this mean I can't get a sorority party tonight? No panty rage for you, asshole. Daddy, no! Shut the hell up. Plus, several obligatory fan service cameos, like a brief sequence to, uh, with the dude sins. Unless you're known but still important to this movie are uh, David Bataro who plays the villain's fat, eager assistant, a character that they made um, so many food jokes about that he apparently gained like 30 pounds during the filming of this because he had to eat in every scene. And last on my list is Bam Majera. He plays this character, Lenny. And you know, for being a central character, he basically has no purpose. None of the story arcs revolve around him. He's just the smug bouncing board for Deco and Ryan's character. Pretty much every character in this movie is being shat on by everyone else in the movie, except Baron Majera. He's always kind of assumes the Bugs Bunny role, you know, the character that always has the upper hand and gets the best of everyone else all the time. And then you consider the fact that he cast this porn star to be in this movie, just so he could drape her over him in a couple scenes with getting like almost no dialogue whatsoever. And then like, he writes in that she's his half-sister. Get off your sister, you little dirtbag! It's my half-sister. <laughs> my problem isn't necessarily how douchey it all is, per se, but how unlikable and uncharismatic he is every time he's on screen. We already know the whole thing about Ryan Dunn's character, but I'm going to point out, I only really laughed when Bam wasn't in the scene making these ruthless, unwitty quips about the whole situation. I am not attending any party where you're gonna humiliate yourself more than you are now, which is pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> like what's weird about it is that in, in other formats and in real life, he's a very, he's a naturally fun person to watch. But here- You are kicked out of your house and you're more than welcome to stay at my place. You're just saying that because you got drunk together. Yep. <laughs> So, considering the zigzagging story, huge cast of constantly shouting people, it should be apparent that this movie is pretty packed with energy. But what kind of energy is the question, though? There's plenty of beautiful forms of chaos you can integrate into your art. This is the type of chaos that people go to therapy over. The bulk of what this movie intended to be comedy really just turns out to be the physical and emotional abuse of basically everyone involved. The Ryan Dunn thing is like the rest of the subplots, though. It follows a trajectory of things getting worse and worse and worse, and it constantly has to do with people being horrible to each other. Then there's this house party, where basically everyone conspires to trick him into getting in bed with sweet little Ralph. And then, once they catch him, they broadcast it to the world that he's trying to sleep with a guy. And then he goes on to become like the pariah of the town because of it. Oh my god! My nephew's gay! This is crazy! I'm gonna kill my gay nephew if he ever tries to show up here again! Doesn't this make you miss good old-fashioned 2000s comedy people? And then, whom I haven't mentioned yet, there are these two recurring characters uh, show up many, many times who are really only here to serve one purpose, which is being an obnoxious, over-the-top representation of a hypersex gay man. Oh my god! Look at those sweet jeans! That's really just about as complex as it gets. They're, they're not. They're, they're not funny. There's this chocolate scene, and I feel like there's a subversive joke in there, and I'm just gonna pretend like there's not. And then, and then I want to refer to Ralph, Mark the Bagger's character, and his whole story arc, which he's one of the few genuinely likable characters in this movie. And his first scene is in this classroom, which looks like it kind of came out of a trauma movie. And and Joe Franz is playing the teacher, who goes to berate him for his bad grades. 
And in the commentary, it's revealed that Joe Franz thought it was most fitting to channel his traumatic experiences with his dad as a child in this scene. Get out! Get out of here! Get out! Get out! And I just, I think in most instances, the average person usually wouldn't refer to their abusive household vibes when they're trying to make a screwball comedy. And then there's just plenty of scenes of just completely random aggression, like, you know, the Blood Count Gang, their cameo, they play these paramedics, and as after pawns, he gets beat up by Compton S. Terry and his group of friends. And they didn't want to be disturbed on their shifts, so they just kind of brutalize them as they bring them to the hospital. In this completely out of the blue scene of uh, people in drama class costumes beating the shit out of each other, um, which really was a scene that had no rhyme or reason whatsoever, which is actually something that kind of points to another deeper layer, which doesn't just permeate this movie, but all of BAM's projects. It's the celebration of pain and bodily harm. I, I guess it makes sense that given the feral nature of these people that their instincts for war and pain is a little more alive than the rest of us domesticated kitty cats. And I've always found this kind of relationship with pain to be kind of fascinating. What is it in their minds where they're like, we need to make this movie funny. And the thing that they think of is just punching somebody in the face. Uh, enough you. Get out of here. Oh! Like, maybe without even realizing it, they're making some, like, esoteric Gnostic commentary on the human body and flesh. It's just these people seem to be absolute slaves to these compulsions to cause other people pain. Hey, Mr. Rodriguez, how do you feel about the outcome? No. Oh, hey, I told you. Yeah, that's how I feel. I'm better than your face, stupid. <laughs> it seems like there's just something that wakes up in the bowels of these people that just kind of overcomes them with an impulse to destroy, and they just throw a punch. Oh my, oh my god, god, you have a fat lip, dude. You okay? Dude, oh I think my you actually, you actually knocked out my, one of my teeth. No. Uh -huh. Dude, I missed my teeth. I didn't hit you that hard. Yeah. And I've always found it really remarkable how, like, they still have this cohesive group that is on board with this idea that at any point in time their tooth might be knocked out. Now, and I can sort of understand the physicality and aggression considering plenty of them were involved in Jackass and that was already their brand. Bam seemed to need more of his own ingredients to add to the hostility of this movie's atmosphere. And one of those ingredients was is just the absolute oh, yeah, putridity. Yeah. I, now, and I, I've seen a lot of gross movies before. John Waters, Pasolini, Lena Dunham. Uh, but none of those really quite caught me off guard the way this movie did. Like when, without warning, freaking Brandon Novak takes a real shit on camera as it pours out of either side of his denim Daisy Dukes. Stop it! I felt like I had been accosted. And it's just not a line you expect a movie to cross without you at least knowing about it beforehand. And once you cross that line, there really isn't a limit to what can happen next, you know? And so it's like, well, thankfully this movie didn't quite go that far again. Uh, it still had a lot of room to run around. And it did. <laughs> And I'm not trying to be mean, but when I look at Novak, I think to myself, he's probably the person who could make shitting seem as raunchy as possible. I, and even just the whole garbage juicer thing, which is kind of innocent enough, but the way the liquid comes out and it really looks like garbage juice, and everyone just starts taking these deep sips of it, um, even that kind of made me clench a little bit. Like, they are clearly going out of their way to make sure these moments are in this movie. And, um, hey, Natalie. Natalie. Yeah, that, that stingy titties. <laughs> Na That's Missy's friend. <laughs> Natalie Camagna, she's, she's awesome. She actually had a problem with picking her nose and eating the boogie on camera, and then I, I begged her, and she still didn't do it. I think you gave her, like, 50 bucks, and then she did it. <laughs> um, which goes to show anyone can be bought. I think if you're an intuitive person, you can kind of gather from this movie that many of these ideas did not come from sober people. And then you, then you start noticing like how many scenes in this movie are either at a bar showing excessive drinking, and then even when they're not at a bar, they're still drinking anyway. You know, you start to get an idea. There's a good chance there's a probably pretty dysfunctional underbelly to this movie. But, and the reality is, is when you have this much vibrance, you really run a great risk of tumbling into excess. In the commentary, he just he goes from scene to scene mentioning how drunk he was in every single one of them. And, and then like how Novak, he kept sneaking off to do heroin during these scenes. Told him to be here at eight o'clock in the morning sharp. It's now one o'clock. I don't know why, but whenever we're filming a movie, he just decides to start doing heroin again. So 
kind of knowing the substance abuse behind a lot of this sort of puts a dark feel behind a lot of it. So just for a second, I want to go back to the classroom scene with Joe Franz, where he defines the term mean hags, the name of the movie. A group of socially inept, emotionally maladjusted individuals, speaking of which, Ralph! And you know, I think there's kind of something in that that kind of helped me to see something that seemed like it could have some heart to it in this movie. And maybe this resonates with me in particular because I was exactly in the demographic for Bear Majera's stuff. I was a young adolescent male raging with puberty, where the number one thrill came from just breaking social norms. And the reality is, is when you're at that age, not many people across the spectrum of society really like you. Because genuinely, you're annoying as hell, and I know that. But at the same time, you can't help it. And in, in, in that period of life, sometimes you can really start to internalize these feelings of rejection from And at this stage in life, the magic always happens if you're able to get together some camaraderie of weirdos who also have the same naive lust for life. And if you manage to get together a little click, and it's not that uncommon, I don't think, for people to start making kind of these monuments of sorts to your common acceptance of each other. And in a lot of ways, that's what I think the CKY videos were, which this is kind of really an extension of that. Now, the beginning of it all was way before YouTube, and I don't imagine that there is much expectation that many people would ever see these videos. It was untainted by any need to be in any way commercial. And honestly, this is what I think might be the most cool thing about this, is Bam Majera really did persist in keeping those roots alive long after he had hit real commercial success with other stuff like Jackass. I think it's rad that he stayed in Westchester, Pennsylvania and continued to feature it in all of his stuff, which I'm going to admit, I do really like the look of the city on film. And I think it's rad that even though all he does is abuse them the whole time, he keeps his childhood friends involved in all of his projects. And, and despite the delays, we have to mention that Bam made a relatively shoestring movie with $750,000. And a year after its release, Jackass 3D came out, and that was made with $20 million. And then you consider how much of a pain in the ass it is to actually get a movie made. It's, not, it's hard not to see a little passion involved in this. And I'm, I'm glad this movie exists in Bam's universe, okay? I'm happy to hear that he does indeed have some memories for making it still. And, and I feel like a way more experienced movie watcher having seen this. 